Also, did Jordan get a chance to check in? Did everybody check in? No, not everyone has. Yeah. I was just going to comment that, that the overriding consideration in that conversation that we just had is that each of us looks at the world through our own filters. It's an inevitable feature of at least human mental processing. We test everything we see against what our experience is and we believe that our experience gives us wisdom and insight. Um, that's contradicted by my scientific training, which there, there's never any real truth. You're only doing an experiment to try to get closer to an understanding and it's the best approximation at the time. So I think that's something that we can examine in any of these books, but it's, it's intrinsic in what each of us responds to in the book as well. Thanks, Judy. Um, is there anybody else besides Jordan who needs to check in? Um, I think we went around. Jordan, do you want to do a, a quick check in? And now you're on recording, so you're different than the rest of us. I prefer to uh, not break the flow of this wonderful uh, emergent conversation, so I will skip a check in so the conversation can emerge. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. Bill. Okay, so this one for me is just a process thing. I cannot just personally participate in a conversation and also try and make notes and look at what is happening in the notes. I literally cannot do that. If I do that, I will not hear what you're saying, even though. It's in my ears. Yeah, I so agree. I, and I, I, so I don't, I, this is me. I can't, I think there was a time when I was much younger. Maybe I was fooling myself then, but here's where I am now. Um, I would like to say, if, because of what, what if Trevor. I could, if I could ask about that without disrupting your, your next thought. Um, uh, I think that's fine. I, you should concentrate on the conversation. Uh, what what do we think, and maybe for everybody, what do we think about me sharing the, the notes as, as we're going? Uh, is that going to be disruptive of people, or is that helpful? If I read the notes, I won't be listening, or vice versa. <laughs> can, well, you see people, can you see people enough that you can still see people, or? I'd rather see faces Wait, bigger as a personal preference. What's that? Um, I'd rather see faces bigger as a personal preference. Okay. Um, I also have the uh, notes. <laughs> yep. So if you want to see notes, uh, log into the Google Doc and um, let's see faces. Thanks, Bill. You were you were about to say something else. Yeah, as a sidebar, if the group really wants to get to a place where we have notes and smallest faces, I mean, I will just not look at the notes. I have enough. <laughs> I have enough discipline to do that so that I actually can participate. Trevor, I'd like to say what you said really struck me because one way that I am reading this book is to sort of note where I'm like, oh, did you guys just really say that? And maybe put a check mark. And I think I will go back and make some of my own annotations, but just move on forward. Okay, just you said that. What's next? So I really would like to give them a full benefit of the doubt that they are just doing their best to try and do their own unearthing of all this stuff and to you know provide a different context. So for me now, I'm just like, okay, I'll put on your rose-colored glasses and we'll go see what the world is like. Maybe, you know, who knows? I might, you know, maybe I'll bump into a rock. I don't know. But so, but I appreciate the you know, for me, that's the fact I am buried, right? I mean, I am buried in the culture of the United States since when I was born, living in New York City, riding on the subway, reading advertising, looking at what's on billboards. I mean, it's like baked. So that is what I am trying to like. Can I chip away at this thing? <laughs> See what's, what's behind there? Um, anyway, so uh, that's... I uh, so even though I think I you know I, here's the question the question came up maybe at the end that I might try and do this myself 
maybe when I finish reading it, a section, you know, has a button of mine been pushed? And which one is that? And just write that down. Because that would give me an opportunity to learn partially about what I think, as well as maybe what is provided by actually thinking about it. Um, Hank, if you could wait for a sec, yep. um, okay. or more than a sec, but, uh, so one of the things, because of the way that the, the meeting emerged, we didn't capture what Trevor said on the recording. Um, it was some pretty juicy stuff. So part of me is super sad and, and I'm like, oh shoot, I screwed up. Um, part of me is super happy because I'm looking to the future people, future white people watching this recording and going, hey, I, I was there when Trevor said that thing and you guys weren't. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I purposely like treasured that moment for a little bit because it, it wasn't recorded. Uh, do we want to kind of go back and, and get the gist of that over? Um, yeah. Do we want? I think, that, I think that would be desirable. Trevor, do you feel scared. like recapitulating that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, the um, you're starting with a skepticism of of yeah. one ground. So, so what I think, I think the book is great because it gives a wide diversity of different cultures a chance to sort of speak, and that's great. And actually, I mean, I, I, I've done a lot of, I was. I did start writing a book about history and it overwhelmed me because I realized that since about 1980, the amount of stuff we actually know about the, the range of cultures that has existed has exploded. Um, a lot of that is to do with things like rescue archeology span in India and China and places where they've started to develop very, very rapidly and, and, and um, urbanize. And it's done loads and loads of rescue archaeology. It's completely changed what people thought about the history of those places. And they are two very important places in the world. So, and I, and I wanted to write this book and I couldn't even keep up with it because I just realized it was my, a global research project, which, uh, which is just beyond, beyond one person doing it. So, so I think the point is the confusion that very easy to make, this is probably not quite what I said before, but it's related to it, is that, and I'm going to quote a little thing that Graeber says, because I've got it in my notes here, and I could share these notes at some point, but he talks about, uh, it's, it's on page 25 actually, which I think somebody else mentioned, he talks about, you know, there were lots of things going on in the world, much more than just night, people wandering around in hunting bands. And he says, the answer, question is, well, what was going on? He says, the answers are often unexpected and suggest that the course of human history may be less set in stone and more full of play, playful possibilities than we tend to assume. And that's a very, very good point. But I think his tendency is to overestimate the playfulness within any one of those cultures. Playfulness is something we value but i mean even if, if, you, if you're a muslim i know a lot of people who are i know quite a lot about the islamic tradition but there's an expression called bida in the just in muslim islam and there's 1.2 billion muslims on the planet bida is the word for innovation and they are very very suspicious of it they consider innovation to be escaping and leaving the essence of their tradition so they're very uncomfortable about it so it's not even just indigenous it, it cultures that are, that are not literate that we're talking about here. We're talking about a major culture that we're still in the same world with that, that intrinsically is very, very suspicious of innovation and playfulness and thinks it's actually quite dangerous and suspicious. Now, I don't think we tend to take that into account. It's a much bigger thing. Sorry, that's not quite what I said before, but I think it's relevant and similar. Just sort of around the same I, thing. I wonder, uh, kind of a, a gloss of what you said. I, I want to capture that too. Or, um, uh, what you were saying was that you 
you had a mistrust of uh, Graeber and Wengro because ultimately they couldn't represent other cultures, even though they, they gave it a good shot. Um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, they tried and they, they were aware of that failing, but, but ultimately they can't, right? Um, so um, I, I, think, I think I'd like to hear from you about that. I, I also really liked the story about um, the, the stone temples and how those, how those get built. They must have been built by charismatic leaders um, and they, they you know, have a representation of heaven uh, to make the, the stone temples. And then that charisma ends up collapsing into oppression. Um, yeah, so. I, I think it's a universal pattern, and it, it, it relates to the fact that when Grove, Graver, sorry, in debt, in chapter five of debt, first 5,000 years, he talks about Something moral like modalities. That. Sorry, he talks about moral modalities, he says there's three of them, and he talks about one of them, he calls communism, which I often think is a red rag to a bull for a lot of Americans. So I think it's better to call it unconditional care, like caring for people with no expectation of reward. Yeah. Could talks about exchange, which is kind of deal making, which is generally, as he says, between strangers. He talks about hierarchy, but he doesn't distinguish between um, a kind of hierarchy of somebody that's saying something that you are drawn to and you might want to participate in voluntarily, which I call guardianship, yeah? And then there's conditioned hierarchy, which is a power structure that is oppressing people by putting them inside a power structure. And I think they're different. And I don't think they made that distinction. I don't think they understood that distinction very well. It's what I wanted to talk to the guy about, because I think it's quite an important point. And he relates to that thing about a legitimate form of, of inspiring people to participate in something and then it turning into an illegitimate hierarchy because it becomes oppressive. And I think if you look at the rise and fall of civilizations, that's the cycle they go through. That was yes. what happened. So, so are you, Trevor, do you mind if I pull out a couple other things from my, from my notes? No, no, I'm, I don't want to dominate this conversation. So. No, no, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think Pete, um, I took some notes right in the, the heart of what I think you were trying to get back to. And I think this is, this is <laughs> really important, right? So, so Trevor, uh, please correct if this is not what you're saying, but let me try to mirror back what I think you were trying to say. You were, you were talking that before there's, there's the narrative that uh, there was these egalitarian small bands of hunter gatherers, and then it was kind of agriculture. And then that led to cities and we started to organize ourselves. You were pointing to some of the ancient stone temples that obviously took a phenomenal amount of human organization. And I heard you say you feel like they're underestimating the extent to which getting people to come together and do something requires that inspiration. And that's often that inspiration is often associated with something of the divine, the idea that there is a external patterning, patterning that's being sensed. And that maybe we have the, the opportunity for some element of that patterning to end break and become represented somehow in our present reality. And, and so there's a start of many ideas and traditions that is a idea that's so compelling that people want to voluntarily associate with it. And that's required to encourage collective action and that, that in the beginning it's noble and good. Over time, as a founder dies, subsequent people misunderstand the idea. We construct walls around the garden. You know, we start charging rent. We start, you know, establishing the hierarchy around a pure idea. It devolves into basically a oppressive, illegitimate power structure. So what began as voluntary cooperation around an ideal or a idea that was noble and good over time devolves. And that's a pattern. And, and I would just say that you, you mentioned that as the pattern of civilization. I, I see it in the pattern of religions. I see it in the pattern of martial arts traditions. I see it in the pattern of something worthy that's truthful, that's articulated, that's good, that we gather around, that then through subsequent iterations eventually devolves. 
Um, so, so that's like, yeah. Sorry, Trevor, you hit. Yeah, no, that, that's a that's a that is a beautiful articulation of what I was getting at. Okay. And I and I and I, I because Graeber inspired me to think about this idea about moral modalities. I just feel that the, the distinction between being a, a healthy guardian of something and a power a power freak in charge of a conditioned hierarchy, which uses Correct. punishment and reward and becomes a kind of fixed static thing that kills everything is a really important distinction. I want, that's really what I wanted to talk to Graver about when I was hoping yeah. I was to meet the guy, because I think it's really important as a distinction in all our lives. And we, it's easy for people to throw the baby out with the bathwater by being so suspicious of hierarchy that they won't accept something that, that might be something quite healthy and legitimate because they can't tell the difference between them. Correct. Yeah, yes. That's really important. It's very, and it does happen everywhere. It happens, as you say, in martial arts. It happens in cult formation, the rise yep. and fall of religions. Every. It's just everywhere. Yeah. So, so there's. Oh. I, this is a perfect segment to Eric's question on Hobbes and and um, Rousseau. Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau. I, I don't need to. Somebody else could, but I I could quickly articulate those. I think it relates exactly to these these two impulses, um, and then it ties out to the Asian schools as well. So if that's interesting, I could try to do that in less than three minutes, or somebody else could attempt. You should go for it, Jordan. I'm going to approach it from martial arts first, just because we haven't read it, and then come back. Um, in the Chinese traditions, like in, let's say that in the, the let's say from minus 1000 to the year zero, you saw this, like you saw all this thinking and these traditions come up and I've, I've done some of this mapping of this, but, but let's say that in the, the Chinese tradition, there's a tradition of legalism that basically says humans are so innately worthless, immoral, selfish, diabolical, and left to their own devices. It's a state of, um, all, everyone warring against each other, like uh, hunger games, let's say in our modern parlance. And so therefore we need an extremely strong state bureaucracy, standing armitary, army, military, police, bureaucratic control to remove those freedoms and create enough structure in which we won't tear each other apart. And those end up concentrating extreme amounts of power in dictators who rule people against their will right and so that that becomes the inherited often corrupted power structures on one hand um so that would be like hobbes and leviathan basically the 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 view that we're we're so evil from the start that we need strong bureaucracy to control and oppress our our baser instincts on the other side is the as the authors paint the false dichotomy is Rousseau with the idea that maybe we're innately good and we've fallen from grace, so to speak. And, and you can find that in whatever that enlightenment thinking is or in the Christian religion, but that, that, we have, that we have fallen and that there's maybe some hope of redemption, but usually it's painted, as the authors pointed out, in a, in a way that's, that's actually disempowering and paints it until as a continual degradation that's almost like a death spiral you can't get out of. And so the, the authors kind of point that it really limits your ability to think that there might be a solution or a way out of the problem. And so to tie those two threads back to what Trevor was saying, it's like, well, what if those weren't the options? And, and instead of being oppressively controlled by tyrannical hierarchies who express, you know, oppress and exploit us to our detriment, um, what if we could voluntarily assemble ourselves into something that was noble and good, and maybe there's solutions, and maybe we can voluntarily work together to create some of those solutions. And so I, I think that's kind of where the, the authors are going with, with those two storylines. Um, and, and the last closing thought is it seems like it reflects this polarity of, of yin and yang, um, whatever, those, whatever those polarities that are, always are. And you know, the, the chance is to rise up and meet in the middle, forge something better. Anybody want to add to that?
I'd like to add the confounding contemplation for another time of individualism versus collectivism in this discussion. Thanks, Judy. Um, I'm going to suggest we sit, switch gears a, a bit, um, not because I want to, not because I want to, but because we've got time. Time is a thing. Um, let's do the two minute go around. Uh, everybody uh, does kind of a round robin um, and, and talk uh, about, about whatever. Um, I'm going to run us in order of, uh, of how people are on the screen, if that's okay. Um, so Hank, uh, you're up first. Ah, how about that? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I put a number of notes in the in the, the online document, so you can see my thinking about that. Uh, one of the things I really like to emphasize is that uh, for me, this book is about questioning the questions that you ask. It's about questioning the questions that society has been asking since uh, he brings it back in the first chapter at any rate to the beginning of the 18th century uh, uh, with the first confrontation with uh, indigenous people, non-white Europeans who had a high civilization and couldn't understand where those wacky Europeans came from. But all throughout the first chapter, he's talking about the fundamental, the foundational story, the fundamental uh, assumptions of our society. And then he makes this really terrific point. He says, neither Rousseau nor Hobbes actually said that they believed that humans society is really like that, they were doing thought experiments. And doing a thought experiment is, in fact, what I believe they are doing, uh, uh, Grape and Renpro, in this entire book. They are saying something, they're looking for evidence. If they can't find evidence, uh, they say, well, there's no evidence, so I won't say anything, but here are some questions. And I was copying out when I reread this stuff uh, today, a number of the questions they ask, uh, like uh, what if we stop telling the story about falling from uh, some idyllic state of equality? Uh, what if we uh, ask how we came to be uh, trapped in such tight conceptual shackles that you no know, we can no longer even imagine the possibility of reinventing ourselves. Uh, what if we treat people as imaginative, intelligent, playful creatures who should be understood as such? And I love those questions because they're not questions, some of them I might ask myself, but a lot of them are questions that make perfect sense when you read them and you think, yeah, absolutely, let's let's take a, a couple of days or a couple of weeks and think about these things. Uh, so I think, and I'll, I'll just quote a second from, from my notes, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Grabe and Wenkrow didn't want to do was write a needlessly dull book. So they made the choice. They'll go out in a limb and they won't be needlessly dull and they'll be provocative. And maybe as they also say on page 21, uh, they'll say things that are in the final analysis slightly ridiculous but if it provokes people into thinking then they've done their job anyway that's my two cents thank you very much hank um i'm next in queue i'm going to pass for today and so eric um i was very struck by the examples given with where they say dreams and vision quests, um, traveling healers and entertainers and women's gambling, because that's totally counterintuitive to the way I think. And I'm wondering what else is to come in the book. And uh, I mean, I could understand the how when they describe it, how it has some value in certain cultures, but uh, I have to get used to being presented to yeah, lowering my defenses a little bit to let in some ideas that may not I, I'm not comfortable with at first. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Bill. Yeah, thanks. So I don't know you've all seen this is a book that came out several years ago by this uh, Eric Sinki, who was a professor of German and he 
basically didn't get tenure and he left university and he went out and he wrote a book called Nine, a Manifesto. So this is like, it's just a set of little aphorisms that are profound and hysterical. But the opening, just because we're, we're talking about thinking, Hank. So it's a quote from Theodore Adorno. The pleasure of thinking, it cannot be recommended. <laughs> <laughs> here, here. So, I mean, it's just, it goes on from there. It's just a, a very, anyway, very funny and, uh, you know, intelligent little book. Um, so the one thing I want, I want to respond to, when Trevor, when you were talking this thing about, I think you're right about that kind of, way that uh, Graeber and Wingo are kind of like, we're going to look at it this way. And I think you're right. Like they throw out the word communism, you, but you can see them like smirking in the background. We're just going to lay this out here for you people and you're going to have to deal with it. Just like when they call the indigenous people, we're going to call them Americans with a capital A for this discussion. You'll have to get over it, you know, and uh, or, you know, pay attention. But I think in my own experience here, just in our current society, that innovation is also resisted, except if you're doing technology. I have a lot of several friends who are artists, and like, but I got to tell you, you know, it's you got to be out there, and people don't like it. And I went, I was been experimenting with electronic music, which I need to get back to. But the first time I went out, and I was exploring in these online groups. And I found a huge group of women in New York, younger women doing all this electronic music and stuff. And I'm like, holy moly, this is like, I'm in, the, I'm in the so-called music capital of the world. There's not a group like that here. I'm like, no, I want to be in New York City with these young women and they can teach me how to do electronic music. So there is a lot of innovation and there's a lot of experimentation and a lot of it is resisted. For me, that's the, one of the readings from this book. It's just like what Eric was saying, you know, well, we couldn't think of any reason why people exchange items except, you know, collect some money. It's like, well, you got to get out more is what these people are saying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just want to visit with each other, smoke a pipe and watch the sunset. I don't, you know, it's possible. So, for me, like Hank, this book is just a joy to just like, can we just dig into this? Um, and, you know, so, um, you know, I'm here for it. Thank you, Bill. Cece, you're up next. Yeah, I'm going to pass because most of what I'm thinking about would fall into salon seating conversations. Um, the one thing that's really clear to me, though, is that what's missing in whatever we're looking at is what women brought to the time. And I think that ties into, I heard creativity mentioned and individuality versus um, the collective. I mean, my first thought was, you know, in thinking about all the paintings on the caves, did people bring them food or did they consider them, uh, what do you call it? What do you call that? Graffiti people, <laughs> you know, like it's just a totally different way of looking at things. So I'm gonna not comment so much on the writing and save my talking for another time. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I have to note that uh, I, I asked my wife if she wanted to join the book club. And so she started uh, reading the book. She got 3% into it in the middle of the first chapter. So she's like, Pete, women aren't in this book. I'm not in this book. Women are a, are a freaking footnote. I ain't reading anymore. I'm out. So we had a, a bit of a conversation about that in the Mattermost channel. Um, uh, and, and that's going to be one of my big questions. Is this book sexist? And part of it is they've, they acknowledge that they've got a viewpoint and you know they talk about the feminist perspective that did not go over well with my wife um she's like why isn't it the perspective and there are women who have the perspective as well as men 
instead of, oh, we're going to go over and visit the feminist perspectives. Uh, she was royally pissed. And um, every time she hears anything about the book, I get it again. <laughs> and that book, I don't know, you know, anyway, so there, that's another one of the big questions around this book. It does smack of tokenism when it's put that way. Yeah, I, I, I'm less inclined to want those conversations as to just add it. Like, I don't want to blame it for not being there, but let's just yeah. add it. Because I actually think that when Jordan points out the two distinct ways of thought, that there is a way to combine it. And that, I think, is going to come from a woman's perspective. But I just suspect that's the case. <laughs> Uh, Wendy, uh, Wendy McLean had a, a good answer. Um, actually, Mark and Antoine both had good answers to Joanne's observation, which was posted by me, not by Joanne. Um, Jordan, you're up next. I didn't check in. Um, so Bill, thank you for um, suggesting this and bringing us here. Just wanted to say thank you. I wouldn't be here without you, so thank you for initiating this. Um, Stacy. I agree that there's a way to combine them and that it's in the meeting of the combination that we'll find truth. Um, and I think that's what we're here in service of. Uh, the thing that I appreciated about the first chapter and about what we're all doing together in multiple circles that we're in is we're, I think we're coming to a, an obvious realization that the basic stories that we've been told are not true and are not necessarily functional and create tremendous mental, emotional, spiritual shackles that prevent us from moving towards our best possible selves and our best possible futures. There is a, I think it was uh, Tolstoy who said, one of the most important steps for anybody on their, their journey was the liberation from their childhood religion. And he was, he was speaking there from a Christian perspective. Um, but it's amazing when you, when you think about that, it's like, well, liberation from our childhood religion isn't that what's valuable. And history is a little bit like religion in that it's a guiding structure to try to orient you to where you are. And it's a little bit like elementary school and it at least gives you some kind of context and narrative. But if you stay in elementary school forever, you'll, you'll never become what we're intended to be. And so I feel like what we're in the process is a little bit like graduating from or liberating ourselves from elementary school. And we can look back on that with contempt and disdain for its simplicity or we can say, well, thank God there was some kind of story to orient us and at least it got us here and there was some helpful things, but now it's time to graduate and move forward. And that requires that we, we have a completely level, different level of openness and possibility and imagination and mastery and all those great things that, that I think we're here for. The last, the last maybe concept I just want to tie in that I was thinking of is uh, I think Trevor and, and Bill and Hank and others were talking is the, the, the I guess it comes from psychology and maybe from the German something like I think they called it Geworfenheit which is um, like thrownness and so the reality is that we're all thrown into some time and place and culture and, and someone made the comment that wherever you are in whatever time you are, you're not really free with your perception of the world. So it's like you're thrown into some time and place in the world. In some ways, it provides protection and structure and benefit to you from the past that you didn't deserve or create on your own. On the other side, it can be tyrannical and oppressive and you didn't set it up and it's not matched for the time anymore. Um, and so I think that all those existential concepts come into we're all thrown into a time and place. We have the elementary structures that orient us, but then we have to transcend us, transcend them and rise above and through this kind of dialogue um, and, and what we're doing in other places, I think we have the possibility of forging a, a much clearer map of where we are, how we got here, where we're going, why it matters, what's worth sacrificing for, what we might be able to do together, what the possibilities for, how to reconcile the maps that don't match to a higher order standard, all those good things. And um, so happy to be here in service of all that with you. Thank you, Jordan. Michael? 
I'm going to pass as well. I'm having salon thoughts, but but not having fully read the first chapter, I feel like I should should weigh in there. Next time. Uh, thanks, Michael. Trevor. Yeah, I, I want to address the question about <clears throat> about the family's perspective because I think it's really important. <clears throat> and um, I'm doing some very interesting work with a, a co-op, platform co-op, transforming the way that um, social care gets done in the UK. The way it usually gets done is totally dysfunctional because it's, it's a horrible kind of mechanistic, it's not like delivering care, it's like delivering as um, so though people are working in a factory or something, it's just disgusting. I mean, it's like horrible. So we're working on that and the founders are too, very, very charismatic and brilliant women. And they are, they are just fantastic. I love them to bits. And I, I, uh, I sort of taught them about this stuff about moral modalities, because I, I use it as a kind of way of working with people and a way of thinking about what, what, what we're all doing. And one of the reflections is that if you think about infrastructure, I, de I define infrastructure as all the stuff that sustains us but we don't notice it's there until it doesn't work anymore yeah so we you know, here i am sitting in a room with an electric supply electric power i don't think twice about it here we are with this computer it works i'm talking to you guys but the amount of layers of infrastructure that made that possible that we don't even think about is staggering. I mean, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And the perspective I take is the ultimate infrastructure that sustains human life everywhere is women's work. Yeah? And because it is so taken for granted that it's going to get delivered, because actually all bets will be off if it wasn't, everybody pays no attention to it and doesn't respect it. Because it, oh, well, the women will always do that, so we don't have to worry about that. Us guys can all run around playing our games and being clever and doing all that kind of stuff because they'll look after the kids and they'll do all that. And actually, I think that's why they don't show up in history. Because in so many parts of the world, they are the sustaining infrastructure that keeps everything else going and is taken completely for granted because of that. And therefore, they're not in the story, which frankly is ridiculous. But I think that's why that is. Um, that's sad, but true. I think that is why that is. Thanks, Trevor. Judy? You're muted. I don't do very well with dualism. So the opposition of feminine and masculine is a problem for me. Um, I have assertive traits that some men labeled as unfeminine. <laughs> I have uh, gentle traits that were far outdone by my husband's gentleness. And so I have, I have a personal issue with a gender dualization and with most dualizations as grossly inadequate simplifications. Um, having said that, I don't think I even read things with a filter of who said them or who wrote them. I read them with, does that fit with what I know? If it doesn't, how could I test it somehow? Um, so I'm very curious about anything that can prove or disprove, validate or invalidate a statement that's made. Um, so I've <laughs> learned in life in order not to confront people that I should start my response with. I wonder if how this would fit in context of X or um, I'm probably looking at this differently, but why? <laughs> um, because I'm often taking a contrarian point of view. And I think that that's part of the value of human civilization is that there are people who look critically at things and I like that that's happening in this book. I'm not enough of an anthropologist or a historian or an archeologist 
to really be able to use my own factual knowledge to cross check. So I appreciate the wisdom of people who are more schooled in those areas. Um, I just have sort of an intuitive barometer that kind of, I'm, I get provoked if something doesn't make sense to me in quotes. And then I have to dig into, is it because of me that it doesn't make sense or is it because of external available information or what is it? Um, so I'm, I'm kind of perplexed at this point um, because the book is dense to read and it's not my field, but I'm enjoying the provocation. Stacey? Yeah, if I could just add one piece. It's not just the role of women's work that's left out. What's left out is the role of play and ritual that while maybe it's more concentrated in the female populations, it affected an entire population. I, like, I think we sometimes we think about ritual as there was only one reason for it and we're not exploring the other reasons. And they're you know, the same for play and I yeah, just want to add that. Thanks, Stacey. I think we've gone around the room. Uh, Rachel had to get off to work, uh, so we missed her. Um, does anybody want to add add something else? I put a little building block on what Stacy said. Um, the role of play and ritual. I guess I don't want to say anything other than I just want to like triple emphasize that as it relates to um, what we're doing. And um, I think one of the things that's happened in our society is that the core rituals that we were playing out um, that bound societies together got associated with what Trevor said. It's like, but uh, it's like there's maybe decent ideas that went through an arc and became oppressive, corrupted power structures that then the rituals holding society together were associated with. And so we kind of discarded them all. And, and it's like, maybe we lost something there. And, and it, I think that there's a deep process of going, like basically every prophecy, whether it's uh, uh, from many traditions, basically says that in the time when things turn better, we'll remember you know, the ancient traditions and, and we'll teach one another those and we'll learn why we were doing them and why someone thought it was necessary 12 times a year to come together and prepare a meal and be thankful or why, you know, and so I think that, I think that's a core part of our work here is to not discard with casual contempt that things that held things together, but to find out what was true about them maybe and, and rediscover and dive into those depths um, in a different way. So anyway, thanks for bringing hey, that I, up, Stacy. Thanks, Jordan. I wonder if we can put uh, ritual and play into a big question, into a short big I, question. Yeah, I I would second I would second that. How how would you say that, Jordan? If it, if you were making it into a question, I've got the question. What? How are we going to put ritual and play into our daily activities? Yeah, and and then so let's say that's that's part one or two. The other part is like, what have we, maybe there's three questions. One's like, has anything been lost in discarding all of our collective rituals? <laughs> like, was there anything important there that we threw out? Um, what is the role of play and ritual in an ongoing healthy society that can last for multiple generations? And then I think Bill's question is then brings it to the earth. It's like, what are we going to do about that? How, how do we insert that? So, uh, thanks, Jordan. Um, and right on the dot, folks. Um, I would like to switch to retros. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we have fifteen minutes, um, and uh, I also want to turn off the recording and, and chat for five minutes, kind of at the end. So. Um, uh, tell me, uh, I, 
I'm, I think I want to share notes and I'm going to take notes into the, um, maybe down at the bottom and maybe other folks can uh, join me down here as well. Um, what, what went well in this call? Lively discussion. Yeah, I think I, we heard from everyone, I believe. Yeah. I, I appreciated how present each person on the call was. Um, a lot of times on these kind of calls, people have their screens off or whatever. I appreciate everybody being really present for the conversation. Lots of interesting notes were taken, both uh, on this document and in the in the chat. Lots of stuff to read over and think about. What else went well? Good people uh, came together to talk about meaningful <laughs> things. <laughs> Say that a second time, Jordan. Good, good people came together to talk about meaningful things. Questions to explore were generated for the next time. Not having finished the chapter, I really appreciated how sensitive you guys were about not, not giving any spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, you're in for it now. <laughs> it was it was a good kickoff. I mean, we've got a lot to to everyone has a lot to say and a lot to think about, and this is a great way to start. Can we switch to uh, what we might do differently next time? I like the I have, format. I'm thinking what, yeah, record earlier. You could always edit. <laughs> uh, if you don't want to lose somebody's words of wisdom. Anybody else? I'm Sorry, wondering if know. there's a way to capture the provocative, the, the I was just provoked reaction at something we read that we could then bring into the session where we're sharing. By the time I've read something four days ago and I come into the meeting, I will have forgotten what provoked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you can always add that to the chat, uh, the Mattermost. Um, and if you if you tag it somehow, um, uh, you know, if we maybe if we start a, a convention of, of maybe a certain hashtag or something like that, we can pick it up and, and bring it into the next meeting. Um, another, another thing similarly is maybe that's a trigger that it's a big question um, and then you can capture it as a big question. Um, So Pete, um, just one, one quick note is, I think the, I think we could really compress the check-ins and not have them bleed into discussion somehow, because that, that kind of morphed a little bit. So, um, so if we were to really just structure the yep. quick human check-ins. Um, the other thing that I just love, I guess this is an invitation, um, but, but we have this idea of a meta project going that we're going to try to design and build what we're all looking towards. So I'd love to see a connection between the extremely rich dialogue, insights, wisdom that come out and how those inform what we're building as a community tries to emerge and, and maybe just some mechanism to make sure we're not violating any of the principles that are discovered. Like, like how do we use all this rich ground as making sure that we're matching all the best 
principles that we're excavating. So I don't know how to say that, but just an invitation to connect up those realms. Yeah, I get a, a this is a, the chickens. Um, it sounds too structured, but somehow one way I think that might help just contain it would be if we had, when we get together for the thing, we have a little bit of an opening question that you get, you know, you can give, throw a few words out about either the chapter or something, just so everybody gets a short period of time. I mean, we did this on one of these other calls, you know, you got three seconds to type in one word about, you know, how you're feeling now, <laughs> whatever. But something about the chapter that would kind of, you know, cap the, just cap the check-in so that it was really contained. Yep. Um, yeah, somebody I, could, you know, would we somebody skip could the check-in? Well, another thing might be to give it some kind of form, which I think is sort of to what, what Bill is saying. I always think of um, uh, on the, at the Webby Awards, everybody's acceptance speech is required to be five words. And so people get really creative with that. And I'm not saying we should limit it to five words, but if we, if we said everybody, everybody check in, um, it needs to be uh, one sentence without conjunctions or I don't know, where you have, you have 10 seconds or I don't know, something. <laughs> Well, I like that because I'm laughing. I would like to be laughing more. So it's just, a, but that's, that's just me. Uh, do we need check-ins? Or, or maybe I'll ask that a different way. What is the purpose of a check-in that, that we should spend time on it at all? I was going to say that unless there's new people here, that we don't really need them unless we ask, is there anything burning for anybody that they really need to get off their chest before we start? Um, and if there aren't any, then maybe we limit the check into who we are, what our name, you know, what our name is and welcome. And then we'll get to know each other as we discuss. Um, my, my reason for putting in agendas, um, uh, check in as humans at the beginning is mm -hmm. is to kind of get everybody into the the same energy vibe, um, you know, from wherever they're coming from, kind of get us into the room. Um, uh, obviously, we didn't really need it on this meeting, and and we ended up not. I ended up not recording the uh, um, some of the great stuff that happened during the what you know what I meant for the to be the check in. <laughs> um, uh so uh so maybe we don't need check-ins and stacy thanks for the idea of of you know kind of bringing in new people um i always find the you know you know what's your name what's your you know who you are it's kind of meh you know it's it's too long on the one hand if you go around and it's too short on the other hand um because um i kind of personally i like to just get into it with people and then as you said, you learn who, who's, who's who and who's what. But so maybe we don't need check-ins. Um, I do like Bill's idea of uh, a waterfall answers to, you know, you know, what did you think about the chapter? What was alive for you in the chapter? What, you know, what did the chapter mean to you? I like that a lot. I wouldn't call that a check-in. I would call that a, a start of the, you know, the meeting. Uh, uh, I have a thing, uh, what we might do differently next time. Um, uh, and it, it, it's funny because it's going to make, I, I'm, I'm, hap, I'm sad and happy at the same time. Um, we did an amazing thing. People were, did amazing notes here. Um, Eric took amazing notes. Jordan took amazing notes. Um, I took a little bit of notes, not very much. Um, uh, I, I, uh, Rachel and Hank got some in. It's awesome that we had so many people taking notes. I really like that. Um, I was frustrated by having us in different, I, you know, I wish I could see all the notes where people were typing at once um, so that I can go, oh, wow, Jordan's talking about this or Hank's talking about that or Rachel's, you know, typing some cool stuff. Um, and 
in my practice with people taking collaborative notes, um, uh, I like helping and I like when other people help me to capture, you know, capture a thought. Um, so I have a wish and I don't know that this is the right thing. Maybe it, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, I, Eric, I do need a VR immersive collaborative document system. The, the, I have a wish that we could all take notes together in the same place. Um, and then you have a different kind of mess. Um, everybody can see everything at once, but then when people are going off on different tangents, it's hard to tell what's going on. Um, these notes are much more organized. So um, I, I don't know how I would, how I would resolve that. Could we, I'm just wondering, uh, out of force of habit, I was more in the chat than in the notes. And, yep. um, and I'm wondering if we um, handled the document more like a chat so that we were, I mean, not, not that that's, it's literally that's what I, that, but just that we interweave our observations. Yeah. And that's what I like to do, um, taking collaborative notes and during this meeting, I ended up like, I, I give up. <laughs> I'm going to go over and take notes in the chat, actually. Um, so, so maybe a resolution to that. I, I, I don't want to, to collapse everybody into the same space for notes. I think that's the wrong solution. But maybe a solution is to talk about a little bit, OK, here's the section where we're going to take chat style notes. Here's a section where I'm just going to take notes that you know make sense all together. Um, so if we can have that conversation a little bit up front, um, uh, going into note taking, then I'll know how to play better and other people might know how to play better. And we might get a few people who take chat style notes. We might still get a few people who have their own, their own section. And I think that's, that's good. Uh, other things we might do differently next time? Sounds like, looks like the plate is full here, whatever. <laughs> it, it, it's pretty full, <laughs> yeah. So I just want to mention like in Zoom, the, the view we're looking at right now, if you only see one person talking on the right, you can change your view to gallery and then move the bar in the middle to the left and then you'll see you can make the faces as big as you want or the document it shares the screen so if people don't know about that there's also standard standard view you can select and that changes it too standard oh okay well oh, i see what you're doing but uh yeah i like to Sorry, adjust I... the amount of space i'm viewing the yeah. document versus the people yeah thanks eric um, folks, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, we've